what we're going to look at next is symbolic speech. Oh, and I do want to show you that. Do we, do we have enough time for that yesterday? What? Um, the, the, the great quotes and memes? Oh, no. No. Right? That's Voltaire. And that's like Oscar Wilde, but it's not. Um, you know, what's interesting is often uh, people that take offense uh, to other people's speech, they're called snowflakes, right? But the way I look at it is if someone uses their First Amendment right to be stupid, you have your First Amendment right to call them on that, right? It's not necessarily saying you can't say it, it's simply saying, I don't agree. Um, and so I think when someone, you know, it's not, you know, you have to be, I think, aware that someone saying something from a different political viewpoint is not something to take offense to, but someone saying something intolerant uh, or, or uh, prejudice certainly can be called on, and that doesn't make you a snowflake, that's just you using your First Amendment rights to, to you know, call somebody on it. So at any rate, I thought that that was kind of interesting that, you know, we're looking at how sacrosanct the right to speech is. Um, and again, just because it's objectionable doesn't mean you can limit it, but you can certainly take offense to it, <laughs> all right? So symbolic speech. Again, it's kind of a different beast, but it's gonna be the same standard again. Um, in this instance, it's not something spoken. It could be something as simple as black armbands, right? So I yelled at you as you were going out to try to like remember some of this case. What are the black armbands in protest of? The Vietnam, the Vietnam War. War, right? Um, this is a case that looks at, does this kind of uh, symbolic wear cross the line into objectionable conduct? They're gonna use the idea of imminent lawless action again. They're gonna use the idea of, um, does it, like, like what we talked about with public, speak, uh, public speech, when you bring it into the public sphere, does it uh, uh, overlay, overlap on the rights of others, okay? What this case does is sen essentially says, students don't shed their rights when they come into the classroom. However, you don't have full rights, do kind of keep that in mind that there is a counterbalancing interest in protecting uh, the rights of all. So I'm supposed to be able to give a safe, orderly classroom. And for that reason, your right to privacy is limited. They can go into lockers, um, they can go into cars and kind of do searches, whereas you might say, you know, I, I've got a protection against illegal searches and seizures. Um, what you wear, like if you wear something and it's inflammatory and it's disruptive and someone's going to um, fly into a rage, you're going to incite lawless action with what you're wearing, they can limit that, right? What they did is they looked at the armbands and decided that's not really going to incite people. That's not really, in, like a protest in the hallway, that impedes the educational environment. An armband, we're not really impeding uh, people in terms of their ability to kind of go to and from classrooms, and we're not really inciting people um, to be outraged, right? So. In a sense, all we're doing is applying those same standards to symbolic speech. Um, what it is kind of interesting is people can kind of use it to say, well, wait a minute, I'm a student, I have rights, I don't shed my rights. And other people use it to say, well, wait a minute, you have limits to your rights. And both are right. Does that make sense? It, it, it again, is kind of a case that does both. All right, I'm glad we're on tape because uh, here comes some profanity. This, we're not into obscenity yet, but we're into profanity. Um, does, is profanity kind of covered as symbolic speech? We're gonna have a, a, a test case, it's called Cohen versus California, and again, it's around the Vietnam War. Um, this individual, uh, Paul Cohen, uh, goes into a courthouse, he's got a leather jacket, and he's painted on the back, four, word, four letters, the draft, stop the war. So you're AP, and you can probably fill in those four, <laughs> those four letters, it's heck the draft, right? <laughs> um, stop the war. And the question is, um, again, you got to think of the context. He's in a courtroom. You got to think about the language. It's profane, right? Is this protected speech? Well, same standard. Is this, uh, he's brought into the public sphere. Is it going to again impede the court proceedings? No. Is this uh, going to directly incite anybody? Mm, unless they're um, highly sensitive, I no is the answer. So, Again, they're going to use the same standard and say that, you know, whether it is private or political speech, whether it is public speech, whether it is symbolic speech, we're going to use the same standard, and that's the direct incitement test, okay? Um,
really what they see is uh, on some level a large symbolic meaning. It's not eloquent, but he means something by this. He's, you know, there's a, there's a reason he's mad at the draft. There's a reason he's mad at the war. Um, he just doesn't, uh, you know, pose it in the most eloquent of ways, okay? To continue with the special type of symbolic speech that, again, um, probably pushes some buttons. There's a, a court case called Johnson versus Texas, and it's a flag burning case. Um, we're in the 1980s, 90s, you know, it's 89. Um, the United States has a lot of involvement in Central and South America. Often what we're doing there is um, there may be democratic movements, but they're uh, socialist or communist democratic movements. Um, and we're often kind of meddling down in Central and South America, often maybe supporting dictators or other unsavory characters because they seem to us to be the lesser of two evils. Um, socialism and communism creeping on our shores is a little more frightening. Uh, that's the context in which this guy, Greg Johnson, decides to burn the flag at, at the uh, outside uh, Republican National Convention, the 89 Republican National Convention. Reagan is um, in, in office going for the second term. Um, he has a little chant that he does with it. It's, you know, again, it's maybe not the most poetic, but it does kind of rhyme, I suppose. America the red, white, and blue, we spit on you. So there is a, I mean, it's symbolic. We're burning the flag. We've got a chant. There's a larger kind of political context to it. Is this allowed? All right? So um, he is arrested under a Texas law, and he's sentenced to a year in prison, and he's fined $2,000. He appeals all the way up to uh, the Supreme Court, and they basically say he had a right to burn the flag. Uh, for three reasons. One, um, again, I may not like what he's saying, but I can't prohibit speech based on the fact that I find the speech objectionable. Same standard again, right? Only if it crosses the line into objectionable conduct. So I don't like the flag being burned. I hate that speech. But <coughs> I can't limit the speech based on the fact that I don't like it. That's not freedom of speech. I can only limit it if it leads to kind of, like I said, that it, it's inciting people. Two, what else is the flag or American symbology on? This is a slippery slope. If we're going to protect the flag, uh, are my textbooks kind of holy sacramental kind of, you know, things? Because they've got the Constitution in it, right? Mr. DeFranco gave you those pocket constitutions. Do you take care of those? Yeah. Can I arrest you if you don't? Um, you know, money. Uh, if you crumple it up, put it in your pocket, that's got some symbology. So they basically said that it raises this kind of like, um, in other words, you picked an arbitrary symbol to kind of defend. What other arbitrary symbols would we have to defend? Eagles? Um, you know, down, down the road we go. And this was a Texas law that was used to uh, punish this guy. That's not Texas's job. It's a national symbol. It's the national government's job to do that. And the national government goes, OK, then, we're going to pass this Flag Protection Act, which makes it a crime to desecrate the flag, to mutile, to spindle, uh, spindle and um, you know, burn the flag. You can't do anything like that. Well, regardless if there's a congressional act, if they said um, you can't prohibit an action, symbolic action, based on the fact that it's objectionable, is that still unconstitutional? In other words, can a federal act negate a constitutional protection? No. Right? Unless there's an amendment. Unless there's an amendment. So what you see is this struck down in U.S. versus Eichmann. Does that make sense? Like, sometimes people think, oh, the courts ruled on something. Can Congress simply pass a law? Yes, until they're called on it again. And the fact is, you can't prohibit an idea simply because you don't like it. And it doesn't matter if there's a federal act or not. If it's been deemed unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. They just needed to be called on it on a second time. What's the thing with why? Like if the flag hits the ground, it has to be burned. Like uh, that's yeah, that's it? more the, the symbolic that's not necessarily by law, that's yeah, more like, you know, by, by uh, kind of military and, and, and governmental code. Um, I love the, the quote here by Brennan. Um, it was part of the liberal wing of the court, but uh, punishing desecration of the flag dilutes what does it mean to dilute something? You've got Kool-Aid and you're diluting it. You're watering it down, right? It dilutes the very freedom that makes this emblem so revered and worth revering. So it's kind of like if the flag is going to mean something, it's got to be strong enough to be burned. Um, that you know, if, we, if it stands for freedom, that it incites feeling when it is broken. Yeah, that that you know, I, again, and that may not be a bad thing as long as we don't come to blows. 
right? That it, it, it's part of the democratic process. You felt strongly in one direction, I feel strongly in the other, and maybe there's democratic discourse. But yeah, what if that like does, like what if someone does walk up and say, like, hey, I'm a soldier, like I don't appreciate that, and like they don't stop, and then it leads to a fight? Well, like, honestly, the soldier? other side is probably, call it, it, A, who took the first swing? Yeah. But, um, and, and B, would there be extenuating circumstances in a court case based around some of those factors? Maybe. Um, it might kind of affect the charges brought, but uh, again, a soldier or, or someone who served in the military doesn't necessarily have the right to take a swipe at somebody because they object to the conduct. Uh, I mean, they'd be down on the NFL football fields, like, you know, going after players, if, if that's the case. I'll tell you, my father served in Vietnam. Um, you know, he didn't necessarily fight for, uh, you know, blind, demonstrations of patriotism. In fact, it was kind of that very reason he went to Vietnam. It was the idea that these people are being forced to adopt a political system they don't want. So it would seem the antithesis to him to like, uh, I mean, I'm sure he wouldn't appreciate burning of a flag, and but he doesn't feel like when you're saluting the flag, you're saluting him. <laughs> That's He doesn't personalize it that way. So tangent, but I think an important one. All right. We're going to get, again, on tape, kind of into uncomfortable areas. Let's talk about abortion protest as symbolic speech. Um, so what you see, uh, and, and you guys may be kind of familiar with it, is obviously here is another um, tense kind of issue that is really polarizing. Um, there is a hard, people have a hard time seeing, kind of finding middle ground on this. Um, abortion is either an absolute right as part of a woman's right to choose, and uh, they, we wrap it up in the idea of privacy, that you have this right to privacy and it extends to kind of medical decisions you make with regards to your own body. And on the other side, there's people that see abortion as murder, okay? Um, what it leads to is very bitter protest. Um, the protest often extended to outside abortion clinics. And so does a group's right to protest what they're upset over extend to an abortion clinic? Can they begin to invade people that are um, seeking uh, you know, medical advice and counseling and treatment? Can they invade their space? Wasn't this on Family Guy? I feel like it was on I don't. I think it was on some Family Guy. I, like... I, I do watch Family Guy occasionally. Uh, I don't, I'm not entirely familiar with that one. You're gonna let me know if this, this kind of applies and maybe we'll bring some levity to the situation. But can you see how both sides obviously have some rights? You have a right to speech, you have a right to protest. Again, I don't have to like that speech to understand that you have a right to do it. Where and when you do it, that's of a concern. Because are you, you know, uh, infringing on my right to privacy, my right to seek metal, medical counseling, uh, my right to be free from harassment? What the court came up with was an idea of, literally, I'm picturing these nine justices in robes with measuring tapes, a 36-foot no approach buffer zone. Right? That essentially there's kind of this um, invisible force field that surrounds a, a, the entrance of a clinic. And the protesters can be outside of it, but they can't necessarily come in uh, to that zone. Um, so you might see them, you might hear them, but they don't get in your face. They eventually shrunk it down to 15 feet. And, and with it was the idea that it's no longer an impenetrable zone. Two sidewalk counselors can kind of enter into the zone and begin to kind of confer with the person. Um, you could request that they cease and desist, and then they had to go away. Um, and initially the idea was that 15-foot buffer zone followed you to your car. It kind of surrounded you, where you could say, stay out of my space. On some level, this is the ridiculousness that we've reached, where I just think that people can't... Um, understand that rights overlap and that there is a line and if we actually need a measuring tape to figure out the line we're we're in trouble <laughs> on some level more evidence that we're in trouble i don't know if we know the westboro baptist church oh um, boy again uh, this is perhaps the most reprehensible yeah I'm, I'm not as mad about people burning flags as i am these people um who believe that any tragedy that befalls the world is a result of God's wrath and God's mostly angry at, at gay people uh, and permissiveness in society uh, to, uh, you know, recognizing same-sex marriages and the right of same-sex couples. Um, they are twisted uh, to the point where anything bad happens, um, they often will use it as an excuse to show up and protest the funeral. 
a military person dies in service of their country, they'll show up to that funeral saying, see, God hates America. God hates gay people. And that's why you died. Um, with the grieving kind of parties there. Have you seen the amazing house that is across the street? I don't know if I've seen the house, but is this what you're thinking of well, in part? No, that, that counter protests? The, uh, the house across the street is um, across like, where that church is, is a rainbow painted house where a gay couple lives. Okay. Oh, you're talking in town? In the town, yeah. Okay. They're they're neighbor. And it's like their neighbor. Uh, and they do gay wedding ceremonies on the front lawn with signs, with big giant signs that say F you and stuff like that. <laughs> well, I, okay, so that That's may be towards H. Are you talking in Florida where the West Barrow Baptist like Church is? It's like a physical location. Okay, I got you, I got you. I thought you were actually talking, when I said in town, I thought you meant like here. And no, I thought no, all of a sudden there was the ten, tensions between location. like a congregational church and, and, and local people. <laughs> I feel better right now. Church. Yeah, so <laughs> you actually are kind of getting into what I'm talking about. This is awful. But the beauty of, again, someone using their freedom of speech to say hate can be equally countered by someone using their freedom of speech to love. And I love the groups that show up to counter protest and literally shield the, the, uh, the people that are at the funeral. The Hell's Angels show up a lot. Hell's, Teamsters, Hell's Angels, um, other church organizations. You don't mess with a Teamster. I mean, I can't think of anything kind of more scary than them or a biker group literally <laughs> lining up and saying, if you would like to kind of come exercise your freedom of speech, you're welcome to. <laughs> Most times the, the, the protesters from the Westboro side don't show up when they know that these groups show up. I know up. that um, the military, like a, during one of the military parades, the Westboro Baptist Church actually got chased out of yep. D.C. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and, and by military people, too. That's yeah. the, Again, that's another group that might say... Uh, you know, you can exercise your freedom of speech elsewhere, um, perhaps. All right, so one other form of uh, symbolic speech, and that's spending money uh, in campaigns. So here we go again. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you go away. <laughs> go away. Kidding. Go Kidding. Away. But do know, do know that Buckley versus Vallejo kind of falls in this area too, right? It is a form of symbolic speech Kidding. that can't be limited. <laughs> All right. Um, so that does, uh, that does lead us now, we looked at symbolic speech, to kind of go to our next big category. So we've done speech, and we'll run through a lot of that tomorrow. Now we're going to do press. And again, um, there is the, um, the right of the press. We get it mixed up sometimes, right? The right of the press is there so it can bear the secrets of government and inform the people. That's what it's there for. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We need to speak truth to power. We need it. We are... Um, it's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And therefore, um, the press is there as one of the pillars of democracy. It holds up our democratic system, right? And it's there to make sure, if you are the, um, the people in charge of the whole show, you get to know what the government is doing. Um, this is an editor from the New York Times who talks about the freedom of the press, or more, uh, to be more precise, uh, the benefit of freedom of the press belongs to everyone. It's, we, we sometimes think that, um, especially in this era of uh, sometimes random and haphazard ex, uh, uh, accusations of fake news, that the media has, um, is an entity separate unto itself with its own agenda. And maybe it has an agenda, but it's often a market agenda. They want to sell things um, as opposed to kind of, I don't know, some sort of cryptic underground society that's conspiring to you know, um, sway the American public. Uh, but the, the press is there um, as an agent for us, right? It's, it's, and if, if someone is attacking the press, they are essentially attacking your right to know. Um, the publisher's freedom to print is rather the citizen's right to know, okay? But it's not limitless, obviously. Again, they can't print everything and anything. So same kind of standards again. What would limit the rights to the uh, freedom of press? Same kind of things. Like what? Lawless. Imminent lawless action, obscenity. libel and slander, obscenity, right? Those are, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the things that they will kind of use to, to restrict the press. Um, um, kind of like, um, I know like, this is kind of like going to film and everything. Yep. But, um, I know back in the 30s and a little earlier than that in the 20s, they started putting out laws that kind of prevented like a lot of obscenity and a lot of stuff in like film and media and stuff. Right. And that's kind of been rolling back as time is going on. Yeah, really, been rolling back. Um, so again, we'll uh, we are close as we get through the press. We're going to get to obscenity, 
And um, part of the problem with obscenity is defining it. You know, you know it when you see it, but then how do I define it, right? How do I kind of, um, uh, you know, give it a descriptive enough term that, you know, we kind of are able to uh, pinpoint it? The second problem is how we begin to see the airwaves. So the airwaves used to be thought of as public airwaves. And so you had a lot of restrictions as a result, even political restrictions. Like if you're going to use the airwaves, then you've got to use give equal time. If you're a news broadcast and you present one side of an issue, you've got to present the other. If you interview one person from one end of the political spectrum, you've got to interview the other. Cable news all of a sudden kind of just started to um, you know, be something that we didn't regulate. And so you begin to see content sneak in that way. And then the internet, wild, wild west. You can't, you can't help but bump into it there in the internet. So I think it's a kind of a combination of those things. It's the difficulty of defining and the difficulty of controlling the increased democratization of media. You know, it's, it, again, it's good and it's bad. Um, on some level, there's no filter. And uh, you have a lot of control when it comes to like the news and what you see. But sometimes an editor is good. Because otherwise, I don't think these ideas of like fake news would be holding up as much, um, you know. Because there are there is fake news out there, and there is kind of you know uh, outlets that um, are questionable. And it's just kind of because it's, it's um, you know the, the the medium allows that. All right, that's a, that's a great point. Let me um, let me give you speaking of um, actually before I go there, uh, let's backtrack because you remember Near versus Minnesota. Yeah. That is an incorporation case, right, that looks at does freedom of the press extend to the states via the 14th, 14th Amendment due process, process clause. Okay, so in general, uh, again, that was simply applying a federal standard of what kind of restraint to use. What are the two options? If the press is, um, you know, if we're worried that they're crossing a line with regards to secrecy or reputation or jeopardizing a fair trial, or someone's moral sensibility, what's one of the standards I can use? Prior restraint. Prior restraint. In other words, a gag order you can't publish. Versus subsequent, subsequent punishment. punishment. Um, libel, slander, um, ask you to reprint a retraction, um, you know, some sort of uh, apology. Which one do we tend to prefer? Subsequent. subsequent punishment. It's the more moderate of the two remedies, right? And freedom of the press ought to be fairly sacrosanct. So um, again, that's what you're gonna see kind of developed over time. Where it starts, and I believe this is a new motion picture coming out, um, is New York Times versus the US. It's also known as the Pentagon paper case, oh, um, yeah. right? And I, I forget if I'm like imagining it or if it's an actual movie out right no, now. No, it, it is. It's right? uh, Power of Google. You, well, Isn't it the um, and then, then you can tell me who's directing it too. I wanna say it's Ron Howard, but I'm probably wrong, okay? What this is, no, is it sense. is essentially, it's kind of like an expose. It's printed in the New York Times and the Washington Post. But it's this um, printing of a report that's looking at Vietnam and, and basically kind of the, um, it's doing an analysis. It's doing a bit of an autopsy as to how we've kind of, you know, arrived at where we are with Vietnam. And it's basically kind of taking a critical look at our military decisions that led up to it. The big question is, am I bearing military secrets that's going to put soldiers at harm? Well, you got to understand that we're looking at 71 here. And how deep are we into the Vietnam War? And are we on our way of you know, getting out of the war? Um, long story short, what, they're looking, what they look at this as is not something that, again, same standard, is going to you know, essentially um, put anybody at harm, the troops in particular because they're really seeing it more as an historic document, um, you know, an historic kind of investigation of things. Um, I love the quote that, uh, you know, um, this is Brennan again, that only governmental allegation and proof that publication must inevitably, these words are really important, inevitably, it will invariably, it is absolutely going to directly, not five degrees of separation, but directly and immediately, not next week, this is A to B, cause the occurrence of an event kindred to imperiling the safety of the troops, but we don't stop there. So I need to see that this is absolutely, unequivocally, immediately going to put troops in harm's way, and I can't pull them out of harm's way. 
because if I could pull them out of harm's way, you could still print, right? Um, it's going to imperil the safety of the troops already at sea, meaning I can't get them back. Um, and that would only be enough to issue an interim uh, restraining order, meaning if you can't pull them back, then um, you have to wait a half a beat, and when we get them out of harm's way, then you could print. That's how sacrosanct it is. What did you find out? Uh, yeah, the movie, it's called The Post. Post, yeah. Okay. And it's starring Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks. There you go. Is it, uh, who directed it? Um, hang on, I can tell you this. Quick Siri. Siri, who directed The Post? And it'll give me, like, transferring you to India. <laughs> <laughs> So we're on to we're on to other press cases tomorrow, but remind me that we're there. Spielberg directed. 